staying true, not yielding just to have someone in the seat, but truly finding someone that has that alignment with the clear culture, mission, and vision that you're building to, and then always coming back to it. Share what you're doing, why you're doing it, draw people to it, be intentional in your words. And I think there's a lot of success when you can find that brevity in your commitment to your culture. Hey, it's Nikki Llewellyn Gregory, and you're on Gut Plus Science. You're in for a fast-paced, storytelling, action-item-rich leadership growth experience. I hope you make this podcast a habit. I consider it a leadership mentoring tool. Learning together makes us better together, and that is how we change the world around us. Let's get to it. Well, hello, and get ready for a behind-the-curtain type conversation today as I chat with my friend Matt Kistler, who oversees mergers and acquisitions at Alera Group, a pronounced people first, holistic insurance agency, meaning they do employee benefits, property casualty, retirement and wealth management type of services. Actually, they're the 16th largest in the US. I met Alera years back because of their uniqueness to prioritizing people first in their business, building a magnetic culture inside. And I know how important that has been to them growing inside and building a strong culture to then be able to make a strong impact on those they partner with and those they serve and wanting to make sure that all of the holistic whole share that mindset for people first. I admire it. So Matt is in the thick of scaling culture and communications as he recruits new firms to join and the growth is really fast. So how do we grow through acquisition and help all of our people have a similar cultural experience and be on the same page about what's important, telling our most important stories that keep our brand strong. That is a feat. So Matt, welcome. We're going to dig in. I'd love to kick off by having you share your journey with acquisition work at Alera and the exciting growth, but also the problems that you're working to solve around scaling culture and communication during this really fast growth period. Yeah, Nikki, thank you for having me on. So backing it up, how I got into M&A is actually really interesting. I graduated from Taylor University. If you want to back it up even further, you'll love this with a degree in biblical studies and an international missions focus. I graduated and day one jumped into insurance naturally. So the best way to deploy my $150,000 degree was insurance. And the whole reason my best friend, his dad and uncles owned an agency in Indianapolis here and asked me to come work for him. So I did. Since graduation, I had been in the industry Working here in town as an advisor, I was in Washington, D.C. at a trade association, Chicago at a firm called United Benefit Advisors on the EB side. And then I've been in this seat for almost five and a half years. So when I started, I really did not understand or know the space of mergers and acquisitions. The founder and chief development officer of Alera Group had met me along the way. He knew that I was familiar with the brokerage space and working with brokerage. And so he asked me if I would want to come on and join him. And I did. And I've learned a ton and we've grown a ton along the way. Wow. I can't believe it's been five and a half years because I can remember pre Alera Group. And then when you landed there, I was like, shut up. You're at Alera Group. I love that company. Like I was a big, big fan. I can't believe it's been five and a half years. And then also, I just need to shout out the fact that It takes us a long time and not always through our college path to figure out our niche in the world for what we do. I love to reiterate that because I feel like sometimes people feel so much pressure to like know what I'm going to do right now. And it's a journey. So, Matt, from your perspective, what is most important? Like if you were to say, I've got all these things that I have to do to be able to scale culture and great communication while building, what is most important to prioritize? In the almost seven years of Alera Group, we've grown from 24 insurance agencies that came together at one time to create Alera Group. We were about 150 million of revenue day one. Today, we're 1.4 billion, and we've grown substantially through M&A. We also have an amazing organic growth machine as well inside of Alera Group, some amazing individuals that work with us. But as you can imagine, when you see that kind of growth, you have to be really true to your story. You got to figure out who you are and a little bit about the space that I sit in. So there are 67 well-capitalized buyers, private equity backed buyers, publicly traded, where your story matters more than anything. They're buying you and they're buying your culture. And so when you remove money from the equation, what story are you telling? So for us, we've been very intentional from the very beginning of establishing who we are. I don't export culture, actually. So if your agency were to join us, Nikki, I would say, hey, if you keep your words on the wall. You keep doing what you're doing. I love it. That's why I'm attracted to your shop to bring them into a layer group. But at the same time, we've got to have that common thing that we come back to. And for us, that's collaboration. And it's actually a book by a guy named Lloyd Fickett, who wrote a book called The Collaborative Way. So listening generously, speaking straight, being there for each other, honoring your commitments, all those type of key facets of the collaborative way are who we are. 
So that really is kind of that story, that mantra that we keep coming back to is collaboration. You're truly better being a part of what we're building than you are competing against us. So good. I love that. All tides rise is what comes to mind when we work together towards a common mission. So you talked about intentionality being this priority. Let's say we're talking to somebody who's very new to mergers and acquisitions, but just going out to get started on this. Help us understand what does that look like to build the platform for intentionality so that that intentionality sticks through all the things like shiny object disease and all this. How do you do that? I really don't want to talk about, at least in the initial conversations for sure, what I call the shiny pennies. So the really cool thing, the armada that gets pulled up when you join a $1.4 billion and growing company, we have a lot of really cool people. We have a lot of really cool things. But for me, we pointed back to culture. And so I like to tell our story by leveraging videos that we've captured. So I go around the country, I capture three to five videos a year of our partners. They're typically two to four minutes in time. And then I use those to tell various aspects of our model. So if I hear, hey, we have a family owned business, I know for a fact that I've captured that video in Reno. And so if I'm working with you and you say, my daughter's in the business, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I can send that video and show you how they've leveraged our model to perpetuate their agency. Whatever it might be, I'm trying to be able to share with other people through the lens of someone else like them, part of that journey. So we've been really successful in capturing these really short videos that highlight why individuals have joined. I love that. Stories are so powerful. I want to touch on the topic of collaboration. I'm sure in this big growth experience you've had since you started there, you've seen collaboration done poorly and you've seen it done well. Maybe let's start on the poorly side because I'm going to guess that happens more often than not, not necessarily in a Lyra, but people lack the collaboration and then this is what that looks like. Tell us some stories about what lack of collaboration looks like and then flip it over and talk about here's the ideal and here's what it looks like in a beautiful way. We try to sniff that out really early on in the conversation as we meet with a prospective agency. You'll hear a lot of, well, how much money is this worth? Or I'm really good on my own. I just want to be left alone. That's not a great model. There are others that will do that. There are other models that will say EBITDA is EBITDA. They would buy the shop, bring them in and really don't care what happens in a collaborative environment. So we spend a ton of time up front making sure that we have alignment in the model because I know if I have alignment up front in this collaborative model, we will have success post-transaction. So when you look at collaboration, one, it does not come easy, even when you first join something, right? So the inherent risk of collaboration is you're risking something. If we collaborate, I'm risking my reputation or my client for you to come in and help on another side. So that does come in our model and any other model with time. What has to happen is you have to go to the events, you have to meet people, you have to sit through things, you have to be connected, you have to build the trust and rapport of your colleagues. So that really is something that takes time in our world or anyone else's world. And we're pretty intentional our president, Jim Blue, would tell you we create collisions, which is getting two really great people together in a room and seeing what happens. And so if we can continually do that on a national level, this idea that I might sit here in Indianapolis and let's say I might be a really great employee benefits professional, but my client might need my ERISA attorney out of Chicago. They might need our actuary team out of Boston. They might need Mary Delaney here at Vital Insight on data analytics, it could be a team that's collective across the country. And so when you really learn that the power of our model is stepping out of your own four walls and joining this collective that is a Lara group, that really is where your clients are in a much better spot than they were prior to you being a part of us. I'll lead you with this. Navy SEALs talk about always improve your fighting position. Don't just stay stagnant, don't just stay still. And that's the whole mantra that we push. And that's true with our marketing. When we talk to firms, like we're always trying to find and reposition ourselves and tell that story. It's true when firms join. Don't just say stagnant. Don't just sit in your own four walls. Get out and meet people. We have some amazing people coast to coast. So we're really trying and I'm really pushing people to improve their fighting position because it's a competitive landscape. As anything in sales, I have amazing competitors that are really sharp at what they do. We've got to outmaneuver them. We've got to be able to provide a better service to our clients. Otherwise, none of this makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. My notes that I captured here and see if you want to add anything to it around collaboration is the core to a successful partnership. And it starts with vetting the partnership well, recruiting the right partners and making sure you know those qualifiers and sticking to them and taking time on that. And then sustainability in collaboration comes from consistency and regular deposits of trust. What else would you add there? I would add that individuals need to know what they're doing. What's the mission? What's the vision? Why am I coming into work? 
I will tell you that gets harder and harder. I had somebody describe it to us just this week. I was having coffee. He said, well, you start as a relay team, then you go to a basketball team, and then you go to a football team. And as you continue to grow, like you knew the person on the relay team, you were handing the baton to them. And then we became a basketball team and there's more people that are coming in and out. And now we're a full-fledged football team. And I have all these people that are interacting and I have special teams coaches and quarterbacks and running backs. So how do we really bring them all together? And that collaboration is really the only component that allows us to do that. Making sure role clarity is crystal clear as you go in together. In what story are they out there pushing? What are they coming back to as that source of truth? That is the key. If I have 250 different variations of my source of truth, no one's in a better spot because there's a dying to self of sorts. Like, hey, my shop was really good prior to joining a Group, which it was. That's why we paid a lot of money to bring you in. But now if you're a part of this, what is that collective story? And then how do we harness that together? When we find that, when we find advisors and owners that understand that, explosive. So as you shared your background in what you went to school for and just the journey through the employee benefits world, you hadn't done mergers and acquisitions up until this, or that wasn't a main focus. So who is modeling the way for you? Can you share someone that is doing these efforts well? You look up to them, they're mentoring, and you're seeing your opportunities to replicate what you learned from them. Yeah, specifically in M&A, my boss, Rob Liebwein, who's our chief development officer and founder, has been a great mentor of mine. Everyone knows him. He's a great person to have in front of you, showing you the way and getting around. I'm a couple of weeks here away from turning 40. And so I've been reflecting on those that have been impactful in my journey, and in particular in telling the story and telling the story well of what you do in very unique ways. And in particular, I've been fascinated with this vlog, podcast, short bites of culture that people are doing. One is a mentor of mine for a long time, a guy named Tom Batchelder. Tom is on the West Coast. I've known Tom for a long time. He does every Tuesday what he calls Tips from Tom. Just little reminders to salespeople of what to do, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, how you use your words. I truly look forward to those every week. I watch them every week. And it's a great model of who he is and the culture that he brings with his company. The other one, a guy named Gabe Draper, who I went to high school with here in Indy, owns a company in Texas called Factor. And anytime he brings on a new employee, I was noticing he's doing this grassroots conversation. Who are you? What are you doing? How are you doing it? Why did you join? What are you excited about? And what I noticed in that as we've gotten bigger and we became the football team is we're losing track of a lot of this cool collaborative environment inside of a layer group. I was at a dinner in Pensacola with a partner of mine and he says, hey, I didn't realize that we bought this firm and we had bought, I don't know, like a year prior. And it's just because it just takes a while at this size for the people or the message, what happened to come through. And so what I'm using and borrowing from Gabe is to be able to tell our story by highlighting people and what I'm calling across the Lara, just who they are, because this collective environment of Alara Group is amazing. So Gabe does a phenomenal job of taking really short two-minute introductions and interviews with people on his team. And it does two things. And I think it's brilliant. One, it's for his internal team. His internal team gets to see just how awesome it is to work at Factor and the people that are with him. And then two, people like me and whoever else are, are looking at Gabe and his company, I have insight into who he is, the company that he's building, the culture that he's building without him having to send me something in the mail or send me something in an email. I get and understand what he's building by the caliber of people that he's attracted to the organization. Those are kind of three people. And there's a list of many, many more that I've been blessed by along the way to have as mentors. But those are three that come to mind. I love what you shared about your journey, learning from others to lead mergers and acquisitions well at Alara Group and just this key nugget around scaling communication and culture. When we tap into digital means like audio, you're learning through these podcasts or short videos or whatever. And you're probably not listening to every single thing that these mentors are putting out, but Every once in a while, when you do, or the majority of the time when you do, it's inspiring you, it's equipping you. And so we think about how do we do that inside of our own companies? That is a great way to build our internal teams and to equip our network around us to know our story and to be able to engage with them. So I love that that takeaway is really twofold. That's how you're learning, like you figured out some key people that are mentors, and then you're tapping into scalable content that they're putting out and then probably having one-on-ones with them as well, but you're able to have more access to them. And I think it's a wonderful thing for us to think about as we, whether it's mergers and acquisitions or we're growing our company and adding more people and trying to reach across the nation or the globe, how do we do that in a way that scales? And I think that's great. 
And Nikki, what I would tell you is the hardest part was just getting over myself and the fear of doing this. So I'd never done it before. I'd never stepped into this space. And it probably took me nine months of convincing myself to do something I know I should be doing, right? And so once we started firing it up and having conversations, honestly, I really don't care if anybody else listens at this point. Like I'm enjoying the journey and getting to know people. And I feel like if we can continue to share those really great stories, I think people will listen and learn a few things and meet some cool people and go along the way. So that first piece is really just being intentional enough to step out and take a risk, tell your story. I think the beautiful part of what a Tom or a Gabe, what they're doing, it's not in your face. It is a great look into the culture without feeling like you're being sold to or really is what it is, is just to show you or their team what's going on. And I think there's a lot of beauty in that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So let's go back to the priority of culture is core in building through merger and acquisition, what are the foundational components to healthy culture growth? If you were to break down, here are the bullets that I'm keeping my eye on as I recruit people and as we develop to consistently have that healthy culture experience. I would come back to that core as we recruit people to come in, either individuals or companies, agencies that we're talking to. It's the caliber of the individual. It's staying true to who we are. And I tell this to people all the time in the interview process, again, as an agency or as an individual, I will be true to who I am. And I do know exactly what we're building and what we're putting together. And I will stay true to that. And my expectation is for them to do the same. And at any point, we should be able to pull the cord and say, hey, this didn't make sense. I have a ton of respect for what you've done. You're a really cool person. You're just not a fit for who we are. And vice versa, they should be able to tell me the same thing. So if you're true to that culture up front, and no matter if it's M&A or if it's in recruiting or bringing in new people, I think it pays dividends down the road. I think there's a lot of models out there and human capital is tough these days. It's a competitive market space in that sphere as well. Staying true, not yielding just to have someone in the seat, but truly finding someone that has that alignment with the clear culture, mission, and vision that you're building to, and then always coming back to it. And I would also say, as it relates to culture, a good buddy of mine, Ryan Booker, who owns 25 Apparel here in town, he has a great thing is that be brief, be bright, and be gone. And I think that really for culture, and when you express what your culture really is as a company, I think it's the best way to do it. Now, you don't need to drum on and on and on and have 32-minute PowerPoint of walking through. It's be brief, be bright, be gone. Share what you're doing, why you're doing it. Draw people to it. Be intentional in your words. And I think there's a lot of success when you can find that brevity in your commitment to your culture. Done. Person. Front. Well, being a sure. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Let's talk about habits. Talk about the habits that you and your team are creating as you're leading this effort to scale culture and communication. What are you noticing that is working and you're doing that repeated or what are you seeing is coming with regards to habits? Yeah, so habits are just one, it's communication. So we're always looking at what the market is doing. So what our competitors are doing, what they're saying, how they're saying it, why they're saying it, what land they're claiming as their own. It's kind of the weird world of marketing. You can say about anything you want. And so just figuring out what is the angle that they're taking? How are they presenting themselves in the marketplace? I'm coming back to the original comment of improving your fighting position. Our team and what I'm trying to do on the M&A side as we express to this community what we're building is how do we improve it? How are we skating to where the puck is going? I don't care in so much where it is today. I know where it is today, but I am building towards the future. So when we have this conversation in five and 15 and 20 years, it's like, hey, how did you continue to do this? We had this really great model. We continued to define it. We were competitive in what we did, and we were always building to the future. And so all of my conversations with the marketing team and what we're putting together, it's how can we be innovative? How can we talk to people in a unique way? How do we tell our story in a unique way that resonates with the individual on the other end? And so really communication for me is that number one piece with my team, just making sure everyone understands exactly what's going on in the market today. Love that. Communication habits are so important and it's so easy to overlook or assume. And then there's like a stat out there that says it's a minimum of seven times that they have to hear it because if you're in leadership, you've been working on it for so long, it's in you, right? Like many, many times. And then you're like, but we put out an email. It's just a great reminder. It's so much more than that. So communication habits, all of us can define what are ours and let's hold each other accountable to executing those. I love communication being your core answer. Let's go to storytelling and let's have you illustrate the power of storytelling. Can you give an example 
of a story told by you or one of your peers inside of Alera, and you've watched that ripple effect and it's helping throughout. So there are two stories that I love to tell that really emphasize that, again, the culture, the model, what we've put together. I mentioned the collaborative way earlier. So I remember a few years back, we were in the leadership team meeting in Deerfield, Illinois, where our company is headquartered. Our CEO was talking and he was expressing his opinion on something in our chief legal counsel, a guy named Peter Marathis out of Boston. He chimes in and he says, hey, Alan, you're not listening generously, which again is one of the key tenets of collaborative way. And Alan, to his credit, paused. He said, Peter, you're right. Doesn't mean I'm going to change my mind, but I do owe you the right to actively listen to what you guys have to say. And he sat down. And at that moment, that's when I knew culture-wise, this isn't just like, oh, we have the collaborative way. Oh, we listen in generously. Oh, we speak straight. It's actually ingrained from the top down. So that is one story that I love because I think it just underscores the exact culture that we're building at Alara Group. The other is we have this really cool component to our company that's called Profit Centrist. It's not necessarily unique to us, but it's one thing that I love where we can get equity in a layer group into the hands of non-equity holders in a tax efficient manner. So why that's important is as multiples have grown for these insurance agencies, it's really difficult to get Sally down the hall who's been with you for 20 years and is your right hand, a piece of what's called the action, right? To get them engaged and involved. And when you come back to collaboration being that key component of my model, I want Sally down the hall when she gets a call from me to answer the call as an owner, to be like, yeah, this is amazing. What's up? How can I help? And so what we've done is we've created this profits interest center where they can benefit from the growth of the equity of the company. So I was in Newport Beach right before COVID at our shop there in Orange County and walked up to the front desk. I believe her title was Director of First Impressions, which I still think was pretty awesome. I walked in, I said, hey, I'm here to see the managing partner of the office. And she called back and she leans over and she was like, how is the Lara Group doing? And I was like, I don't know, man, it's going well. We're doing great. We're bringing great firms in and doing good stuff. And she leans in closer and she was kind of like, no, no, how is the equity doing? And so for her, she was a part of this profit centrist component at her age to be able to be blessed with the opportunity to be a part of the ride as an equity holder in Alara Group was invaluable. It's truly life-changing stuff. And so I love that we have that component that individuals from the director of first impressions to a $5 million producer all have this same ability or this same access to be a shareholder in what we're building because I believe that that component being a part of the equity of Alara Group truly helps drive in our world a lot of this collaboration that happens. And so those are two of my really favorite stories of what we built here at Alara. That's really good. And I love to hear stories about employees taking ownership, very proactive, excited to know the news because they're part of the action, as you said. I love that. Awesome. Okay. So Matt, before we head over to our lightning round, can you leave us with a challenge to these leaders that are listening to help them better scale their culture through their growth, whether it's M&A or just fast growth, what's the challenge that you want to leave with them to put them on their toes, if you will? You got to step out and take a risk. What I have found is most people in marketing or in podcast or stepping out and telling their story have a hesitancy because it's a new wave. It's a new technology. It's a new concept. What do I say? What if it flops? Like none of that matters. That's what I would tell you. If you're committed to the culture and you want to tell your story, even if it's to the 42 people on your team or to the 4 million people on LinkedIn, it really doesn't matter. Go out there. If you feel compelled to tell your story, do it in a meaningful way. And if no one listens, you'll get better. You'll hear the story. And if other people listen, amazing. But really, you've got to take this step. You've got to just start moving and you know in your heart of hearts that that's something that you should be doing. You should challenge yourself to do stuff that makes you uncomfortable because I think the result will be amazing in the end. Yeah, amen to that. Plus one. Love it. Matt, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back to our lightning round so we can learn a little bit more about the personal side of you, some things that many of us, I'm sure, don't know yet. So we'll be right back. Shout out to the Talent Talks podcast by Titus. Show host Jonathan Reynolds, CEO of Titus Talent, brings a unique blend of fun, humor, and passion. Jonathan's vibrant energy shines through the microphone as he engages with every guest live, creating a captivating synergy. Jonathan collaborates with each guest to delve into topics that empower leaders to make optimal hiring and engagement decisions from a people-first lens. You gotta give this podcast a try. Talent Talks. 
All right. I'm back with Matt Kistler on Gut Plus Science, and we're in our lightning round. So Matt, here's how this goes. You didn't have time before our episode today to prep these questions. This came up very quickly. So it's kind of like really quick responses to these questions. The first one we ask everybody, we're building an ever-growing recommended reading list of favorite books. So favorite book of all time or a favorite recent read that you want to add? Yeah, so I would have to say it's Beneath the Scarlet Sky is a favorite book on World War II, Italian resistance. It's phenomenal. It's fantastic. I'm an Audible listener for the Audible people in the crowd. And that is one I've actually listened to twice. I think it's the only book I've listened to twice. So Beneath the Scarlet Sky. Oh, solid recommendation. Thank you. All right. How about hobbies? Do you have a newer hobby? And if you do, what is it and how did you pick it up? Great question. I have four kids, all of them middle school and below. I travel for work. So hobbies are really difficult. So what I've done here recently, probably right since COVID, it's kind of the beautiful nature of iron sharpening iron. I've got a guy group from Taylor. There are 12 of us that get together every year and across the year as well. And we realized a couple of years ago that we'd all gained some weight, looked around the room and we're like, hey man, you're kind of gaining some weight. And the guy looks at me and says, you're doing the same. And so we realized we got to do something. So we started our, our running club. So I've started running and I never thought I would say I like or enjoy running, but I really have gravitated to it and enjoyed it. You know, for me, I'm pushing 600 miles so far this year, which for me is unbelievable. I know there are others that do more, but I do it often and really enjoy putting the miles in and the results that have come from it. Nice. High five on that. Awesome. Good for you. So Matt, where is a place in the world that is just magical for you? I guess to carry on the theme of the impactful time at Taylor University. So I studied abroad in Ireland in college, and there was a campus that Taylor has there in Greystones, which is the southernmost stop on the DART on the train system there outside of Dublin. Every time I think about it, just the impactful nature of that, let's say five months that I was there, Ireland is a small country. It's like three-fourths the size of Indiana. And the beautiful nature of just the country, the people, and it's so small that you could learn about a battle, open up the door to the bus, and you're standing at the battlefield or the Cliffs of Moher, Galway's, Giant Claws, you know, all these great places that are in Ireland. So whenever I reflect on, you know, what is probably the most special place that I reflect back on, it's got to be Ireland in my time there with uh, the Irish Studies Program. Mm, sounds lovely. All right. And finally, what's the best way for people to connect with you after the show today? Jump on LinkedIn. I think that's a great conduit. I post a lot of stuff up there. I'd always be interested in any feedback. If you say, hey, that one really resonated or I hated it or have you thought about this? We all get better when we share our thoughts and opinions. So find me on LinkedIn. Love to connect. Matt Kistler, thank you so much for joining me today on Gut Plus Science. Here's my truth you can act on. Number one, intentionality is the priority when building a company via mergers and acquisitions. Actually, intentionality is the priority anytime, right? We're building a business, but especially during mergers and acquisitions. Culture is core to recruiting partnerships and keeping that the center focus of your intentionality is so powerful. Number two, collaboration is key to successful partnerships, and it starts with recruiting the right partners. We must know our qualifiers and stick to them, and sustainability and collaboration comes from consistency and regular deposits of trust. Make sure that role clarity is crystal clear. Number three, identify mentors and engage in consistently learning from them. Anytime we're stepping outside of our comfort zone, doing something new, well, anytime. Mentors are just so powerful. Who's already gone there and done that? and identify those people and find a system for learning with them. Number four, consistent learning and development content shared through digital means like podcasting to reach all of your people as often as you can to inspire and equip them. This not only builds your internal team efforts, but equips your network and all that surround all the people inside to engage with you and share your story. And finally, number five, one of the most important habits as a leader, communication. Make sure you define your communication habits and stick to them. It's so easy to overlook like, gosh, haven't sent that team email in three weeks or whatever. Having your consistent efforts and making sure you stick to your habits when it comes to communication builds some pretty incredible outcomes. We'll see you next time. We just left the world a little bit better. Now, go do something with it.